his computer, his brain is still at 631. So I hope we should spend time on um, yeah, catching up with us here. Or <laughs> um, we will say you rather. Um, I wanted to say that Robbie um, is the departmental chair in the Department of History and Sociology of Science in the School of Arts and Sciences at Pennsylvania University, which is in Philadelphia. Yes. Um, Robbie has an MD from Yale University. He also has a BA and MA um, in history. No, oh, in English. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, I got some instructions and said Robert's web page is very unassuming. Um, but I have known his writings for at least 15 years and I came to it because my original degree was in history and I wasn't very happy with history of medicine and what was happening. I was always looking for more and I always thought how what do I read and who who actually has some explanations of how the history of medicine also works on a personal level and how people make meaning of illness and how to make sense of it and how to make sense of medicine and so on. So I came across some of his books, of course, and um, six years ago, I think it's already six years ago, I was extremely lucky to be invited to co-author a book and to go to workshops with Robbie on um, the introduction of HIV vaccines in Europe and in the United States which Robbie um, edited, and we, I can't really say that we kept in touch ever since, but when we thought about how to organize this uh, seminar series, his name was, I said, oh, that's about Robbie. And he said, yes, and so he is. Yeah. And um, I don't really want to say more now. Uh, Robbie said he's going to talk about this as an experience diagnosis. Then I think um, I'm supposed to comment on what Rob is saying, but I think we turn it into a tiny comment from my side and discussion from your side, and then we see where we end up, and then we can go together. <coughs> so, um, I shut up now. <laughs> Thanks, Andrea, and for her, and Charlotte and everyone for organizing uh, this conference. Um, the talk I want to give, it's a little bit of a, a little snippets from a bunch of different work I've done but it's all organized around this theme of, of diagnosis, the risk state as a kind of experience even embodied um, uh, state. And um, it comes from a long-standing interest in a bunch of different things, in cancer, in disease classification, um, and in risk, and lately in how we understand the efficacy of risk interventions. And let me, I, I always tell my students to begin the talk saying, telling their audience why the talk matters, why you shouldn't fall asleep. And one, there's many ways in which I think this work can go, but one thing I think that's been uh, for the clinical and more the clinical people in the this, for example, but then everyone is a consumer of risk interventions uh, at some level, whether you're a clinician ordering them or not, is that there's so much controversy over uh, efficacy in general. I mean, the Institute of Medicine in the US published a report saying that we don't have evidence for 50% of things that we do. Some people think it's an underestimate. Um, we actually how things are applied. And probably one of the most controversial areas of medicine where evidence, even though there's lots of attempts to evaluate evidence uh, in meta-analysis and cognitive and various things, are risk interventions, screening tests, preventative medicines, and, and the like, many of which result in the kind of social construction diagnoses that people will be talking about a lot today. Um, and I would say the explanatory model that's given for the lack of evidence for many things we do generally and specifically in risk interventions is something of a deficit model. Uh, we need more data. We need better means of evaluation. We have to reduce conflict of interest. We have to um, pay people, <coughs> incentivize people this way or that. And all those things are true, don't get me wrong. But it's kind of similar to the problem that I think some people, at least medical anthropologists, have sort of reconceptualized in medicine of understanding patients not following our orders as non-compliance, <coughs> rather than asking, well, what is it they're doing? Uh, so it, there's a similar question in efficacy. That is, when people, with, let's say in screening mammography in the US, which has uh, been very controversial, and frankly, the data for women in their, in their 40s just doesn't exist uh, in my uh, reading of the data uh, for its efficacy, nevertheless, it persists. Or, Fetal heart monitoring for routine uh, 
uh, vaginal deliveries. If you're in, a, I don't know how it's in the UK and in America. I mean, the evidence doesn't exist. If the evidence exists, it causes more C-section and complications, but doesn't really change uh, uh, obstetrical outcomes. There's not, not a hospital in the U.S. I know of they don't get slapped on a fetal heart monitor. You know, the minute you're in labor uh, at some level. Instead of asking, well, what are the conflicts of interest? What are the, you know, what, what is the explanatory model? What are the motivations? What's the system? In fact, I think it's a system here that has a lot to do with fear and control and, or, and the ways in which some of the things that we do both inspire fear and lack of control, and at the same time, there the apparent solution that monitor, for example, which it's, 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 it's comforting until it starts decelerating, <laughs> you know, and produces some uncertainty around it. So I've been interested in this general sort of dynamic for a long time. And today I want to think about, um, tell you, specifically focus on cancer risk, which is something, and use some exa different examples. I'll give you a little outline of the talk. I want to begin by explaining how cancer risk became a mass experience in the middle decades of the 20th century, give you some idea of the dynamics. Because sometimes we, we just, I mean, your talk was a lot about sort of the actual individual patient and doctor around it, but sometimes we lose track of the sort of larger social uh, context, historical context, that's very deep rooted that gets risk into our bodies uh, in, in what I'm, I want to talk about today. And then I want to use two examples of what, I'm, this, what I want to talk about most in the talk, which is what I'm calling an experienced risk state. Um, and I'll use one example from the HPV work that I'm here referred to, uh, uh, the life of the diagnosis of HPV infection. And I'll also uh, use the example of men with high PSAs or, and or to be diagnosed with early, usually uh, uh, benign, not benign prognosis, but uh, um, actually I'll come on, it's prostate cancer. And then I'll point to a few clinical, just really point, uh, even briefer than your little points today, to some places where some current clinical and policy puzzles that might be partially explained or at least illuminated by thinking of risk as an experience diagnosis. Okay, so um, this comes from a, a book I read about history of breast cancer, but I just I want to give you the ground zero to some certain extent <coughs> for where, um, where cancer risk emerged in some ways. And um, the begin I have a couple of chapters in my book about William Halstead, who, uh, and, and there were British uh, people doing very similar things at the same time in the early 20th century. Um, uh, did radical, introduced sort of uniform, very aggressive radical surgery for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, the woman, after they had this radical surgery, didn't know if they were cured or not. Uh, in fact, then and now, surgery's efficacy is probably the control of local disease, not systematic disease around the body, which often kills you in some ways. So these women, he, um, Holstead had a, a kind of uh, end result study where a year after the on the anniversary of the person's exam, he sent a little postcard to them and asked them mostly about lymphedema. He was very interested in this, in his own responsibility for causing, which he denied, for causing his arm swelling after surgery. But the woman would write back, <laughs> telling them everything about their lives. <laughs> From histor historians' perspectives, it's a very treasure trove of things. And people would write back. Um, this woman sent some pictures of her reduced arm excursions around it, um, you know, after her surgery, you know, you can see that one arm doesn't go enough. But she also asked a question to him. Could anything, be, and then that, now these women were told, you know, he was very, <coughs> he said, you know, nothing, nothing, nothing remains of cancer in your chest, he did not use the word cure, but it was a kind of constructive ambiguity which still exists in terms like complete remission and total remission today in, in cancer. You know, it was a kind of somewhat nebulous concept. But people were concerned, and they would write back things like this. Could anything be wrong without knowing it? Not knowing of the existence of anything wrong, that's before she had the operation. Uh, be because that was the case before I came to you, this discovery being accidental. It occurred to me that perhaps I ought not to feel so sure and ought to have an examination occasionally. Now this is very familiar to all of us today, but this is kind of the birth of a kind of demand from the, from the patient's end for surveillance. Both people who are, who are just at risk or people who have, exist, who have cancer who often live a life at risk of further cancer. Another patient sent him a little diagram uh, of something that was odd in the upper chest. And you can't read the handwriting, right? don't bother. <laughs> but it's, she says something like, I made this diagram showing the um, position of the seat. It's a light red, I can't read the handwriting right now. Uh, uh, it's between the ribs, kind of locating this thing, you know. And um, Halstead basically wrote back, um, oh, and the same patient wrote him uh, another letter. Can you reassure me at all as to this being only a false alarm? 
to do the slight rheumatism or tell me of some slight test by which I make, make sure of this being a similar trouble or not. Of course, I being alarmed at the least condition that is not normal. If it were not for my previous trouble, I do not think I would even have noticed these symptoms, which do not annoy or inconvenience me. Now, Holstead himself was um, pretty noncommittal and didn't want to do any surveillance. He wanted his data for his studies. And in, in print, he said something that I think still resonates with a lot of clinicians today about the um, ambigu ambivalence we have about surveillance, both with people who have disease and people who are just at risk of disease. And he, he wrote, shall we let women know that a dangerous process may be going on which they cannot detect and keep them in a constant state of apprehension? Or shall we encourage them to seek quote unquote expert advice which may be insufficiently expert and expose them to the annoyance of repeated and useless examinations, each of which for only a brief period, if at all, would bring a measure of, of reassurance. Now Holstead turned out to be on the losing side of a certain battle uh, in this case. Uh, at the, almost the same time he's writing this letter, the American Society for the Control of Cancer was formed in their imperial fund and various things going on in Britain at the same time to say no. We, more testing, more surveillance, this is the way to go to solve the cancer. <coughs> and I want to take you a brief tour, um, before I do that, uh, just to sum up for a second. These women who I'm saying are the ground zero are, are for the first time living alive without apparent disease, because the complete operation destroyed everything in the, at that part of the body. Uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, but they are aware that they have the diagnosis and they, have, they live the life of, of fear. And they want and they demand more surveillance. And there's also some stuff I'm not going to go into having to do with the fact there was a medical response with various kinds of salvage therapies and surveillances that other doctors were doing. And a key issue here was who was responsible. Uh, that is, you know, I'm responsible, the patient for detecting this is the doc, the physician. Um, in a way that cancer, uh, the issue of responsibility was not the same in the earlier years, but I, I don't want to go into that. So how did this, what, what was happening, you know, I said first it was on the losing side of, of something. Well, the American Society for Control of Cancer, which started in 1913, a group of gynecologists and, um, and general surgeons um, were frustrated with the fact that cancer, you know, infectious disease was declining, mortality was declining, yet cancer mortality either was the same or rising, depending on which cancer you looked at. It was very hard then and now to make sense of the aggregate new picture of cancer. Um, and they organized, uh, and, and first thing, it wasn't obvious that there was, should be a public health response to a non-communicable disease either. And sort of the, without knowing it, they had a metaphor which said something like, like infectious disease, bad ideas and misconceptions about cancer and ideas that led to people to wait too long um, uh, exist in society. They needed to break the transmission of these ideas with the public education. And then and now, you know, the, the <coughs> major cancer organizations were about messages, awareness, screening, things like that. So the core message they had was do not delay. And they had um, uh, posters, movies, trinkets, imploring women to uh, survey their own bodies for, for dangerous cancer signs. I was alive when some, you know, this campaign persisted until the 70s, so I remember some of these things. But, uh, and if they found something, to seek medical attention. <laughs> and there was an efficacy uh, message uh, co-joined with this do not delay, which said, if you went to your doctor, then surgery done in time would cure you. Um, and this logic of delay, of course, is, is, is in some sense timeless and self-evident. That is, you know, Thomas Aquinas is talking about uh, in Beware the Beginnings for an after treatment often comes too late. Um, uh, and, and, and behind all this was a frustration with the actual uh, medical progress against cancer, as I said before. Um, and just to give you a sense, I'll, I'll give you a couple of little, I, I, I don't know, how much time, did they, when did we start? Uh, we started, uh, 10 minutes. Okay, so maybe I'll show you a little four minute movie, or at least part of it, to give you a sense of what this was going on. This is a, a po typical poster. These signs were a little bit like a Ouija board or a fortune cookie, because, you know, uh, indigestion, you know, it doesn't feel indigestion. Um, uh, uh, and they came in different uh, combinations, and, uh, and obviously fear, and a message of like, you know, danger and fear was behind so many of these images. So let me, um, oh, did I cut the movie out? No, I didn't. Okay. Um, so I'll show you, let me show you a little clip from a movie made in 1950. Um, that was this exact same, it was a remake of a movie made in 1940, um, 
where, and the only difference is the balance of optimism and fear, but I really don't have time to go into that, I think, right now, why that was changing. Um, and uh, it's the film, I should tell you now, is one part of a multi-pronged campaign that included uh, doctor education, posters, trinkets, and whatever. So let's, let's, let's just watch my second piece. The quiet of midnight hangs over the town. Your neighbor's house, or perhaps it's your house, asleep. for one member of the family. Just one week ago, Mary Bronson discovered that she has what may be a symptom of cancer. 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 It can start, they say, almost unnoticeably. And then it grows and grows. A horror that never stops. Is it contagious? Can my family catch it? My friends? What if it's inheriting? Will my children have it too? What will happen to me? Yourself. 
so the, she goes on, there's this round dramatic operation, and she doesn't have cancer, unlike the first movie, where the person did have cancer. The American Cancer Society, the American Society for Control of Cancer, was under a lot of um, pushback at that point for giving too much fear. Uh, and there was even some mockery of it. They used to, one of the major slogans is one in three will die of cancer, and somebody produced a poster, one in one will die of something, you know, kind of around the time. Um, but anyway, the, the thing I want to tell you about this campaign, uh, uh, and the reason I showed the clip is it was very successful based on fear. Um, and um, a lot of assumptions on about the ontology of cancer, which then and now are unclear, um, uh, you know, or unproven, I would say. Um, but it worked. And what happened was that women with breast lumps and, and, and other ca cervical, ca and cervical cancer and other, other cancers too came to medical attention much more frequently with smaller lumps and less serious and benign disease. Um, at the same time, and I'm not emphasizing the act of diagnosis enough in this talk perhaps, but the, the, the pathologists were both, there's a lot of evidence they were both lowering their threshold for diagnosing cancer as well as creating new cancer diagnoses like uh, the precancers that we live with today that became very prevalent after mammography, but they were actually started in this time the in situ carcinoma, this ductal and um, lobular carcinoma. And what happened in the society is that cancer was widely perceived to be more treatable and curable purely on a kind of um, way that, that has nothing to do with the efficacy of any of the part of the campaign. That is, um, case fatality, if you, I'll give you a, from a statistical standpoint, either case fatality or survival rate is simply a, a, a ratio of number of deaths to number of people diagnosed. <clears throat> if the number of deaths stay constant and many, many more people are diagnosed, the case fatality rate improves and the survival rate improves. And this happened, and it wasn't just an epidemiologist mm -hmm. perceiving it. Cancer, which was much rarer and thought to be dead at <coughs> the moment, um, was now understood to be much more prevalent and curable. And it fed into it. It's a self autocatalytic reaction that kind of happened. I go into a lot of description about the incremental steps, but I think you get the logic of it. Because people participating in this process, it's a very reflexive process, in a sense, create the process at the same moment by, by creating better survival rates. And, case fatality rates by going to the doctor and getting diagnosed. Um, and it's a pop another way to look at it is in a positive feedback loop. And this message and the messengers persisted until we had more technologically based screen, which I'm not, I have written about, but I'm not going to talk about right now. What I want to make a transition to is um, as cancer gets into the bodies of so many people because of the uh, way in which these public health campaigns work, we have a whole, and I want to talk about two specific uh, cancers, kind of jump jumping over the mammography, pap smear history for the purpose of this talk, and talk about HPV and prostate cancer. But the logic of the earlier thing, I think, is important to understanding uh, both these present conundrums. And um, uh, just to give you an idea, the one thing I want to focus about with the HPV uh, situation is how the efficacy of the vaccine has been sold by pharmaceutical industries, and I think is, in fact, behind a lot of people's decisions uh, uh, to uh, vaccinate their children or themselves around it. And this is a poster that was actually from a private medical office that was hanging in the Upper East Side in New York for a while, where a woman, you, you, can, you can see it, she, don't, she won't have to tell them she has HPV because she doesn't. Okay? Um, I don't know if you understand the clinical context of HPV. Uh, in, in the pre-Gardasil vaccinated era, I had undergraduates and patients come to me saying, I've just been diagnosed with this thing, HPV infection. They say it cause cancer, uh, it's a sexually transmitted disease, condoms won't even necessarily prevent it, there's no cure, you know. Uh, uh, and this, well, I, my argument, I'm, I'm coming to my main argument here, is that the logic of all the screening and uh, invasive diagnoses has led to a risk state that is, isn't simply a probability of something happening, but it's an experience. Um, and the idea of the vaccine is that you don't want to become that woman who has to tell her partner that she has HPV. It's not simply you're taking a vaccine to prevent cancer. It's a way of preventing an, an experienced risk state that in itself produces worry and work. To give you an idea of what, what I'm talking about, uh, if you go to, the, and this is still hanging up there if you want to go to this, the Merck, what you, in the US there's various laws for what you can, can and cannot do in direct consumer advertising. Uh, and if you don't mention the product specifically, you can do a lot of things to kind of soften the market. 
uh, for you. Uh, and most drugs have kind of, you know, direct marketing, which mentions the drug a thousand times, but they also have these things where the drug isn't even mentioned, but it's supposed to sort of get at the kind of inner logic of why you should buy something. So Merck has a website called True, True HPV Stories, and it's four little, like, YouTube-y things that look like, you know, like your daughter went in a car and filmed themselves. They are multi-million dollar productions, in a way. And this is one of the four that's on here. And uh, this is what the story is. This only lasts two minutes. When I found out I had HPV, I was afraid of a lot of things. I didn't know what it was. I was afraid to tell my family. I was afraid to talk to people about it. But over the past six years that I've had HPV, I've learned so much about it. I've done so much research, and I've talked to my doctor about my problems, and I've talked to my friends about my problems, too. And it turns out that a lot more people know a lot <laughs> more about this thing than I even thought at first. So there's that. It's important to know the state of your body, so to go and get a checkup with your doctor is ultimately the most important thing. As women, our bodies are so fragile, and we need to take care of them, and we need to know what's going on. So I get checkups every six months. I get pap smears. And every six months they come back that I have HPV. But it's okay. Because I'm healthy. I don't have any signs of cancer or pre-cancer. But I would just say that every woman and girl out there should go get a checkup and should know their status at all times. So, I mean, not to, I think it's fairly true that it doesn't need a lot of analysis, but I think what's, what's being sold is the efficacy of the risk intervention of Gardasil is to not become this woman, to not live in a state of perpetual danger and risk and uncertainty, which information in the form of a positive HPV genetics creates, you know, and, and it's work in the form of searching the internet getting this repeat uh, HPV tests, um, what you have to tell and not tell partners, etc. around. And in many different cancers and non-cancers, there is something like, and I'm going to do this with prostate cancer in a second, there, there are these sort of nebulous risk experiential states which are themselves the object of a lot of our interventions, not the diseases of which they are the states of the that they're at risk for. And that's the key message I want to leave with you. Um, so let's, um, you know, just to sum up for a second, efficacy is often understood as control and fear and the risk state itself. Um, and primary and secondary prevention works to evade the experience of risk, not only the outcomes. <coughs> Getting the risk diagnosis as well. So what do I mean by good prognosis prostate cancer? Well, Actually, let me, I think I'll, I'll just emerge from the data I want to show you. The data I, I want to show you are not my own. I mean, they're the stuff anybody can get from the internet, from these non-historical present things I want to show you. Uh, and a few years ago, not a few years ago, a year and a half ago, the New England Journal of Medicine has a series of case vignettes where they will publish a, they publish a you know, short little case vignette of a hypothetical patient. It's interesting what they put there, they don't put there. And then they have experts give their opinion about what they would do. And then they put it online, and people vote. People not only vote, but they allow people to write in comments. And it's an incredible internet, mostly health professionals of different sort, but often lay some lay people too. They're only identified by their initials, whatever. But you know, this particular case I'm going to tell you had I don't know how many thousands of responses. They published about 1,100 on the line. They took it off. I don't know why. Uh, exactly. But it was kind of a, for someone like me interested in the experiential aspects <laughs> of the rest, it was a kind of a gold mine. And the case was something that. Uh, I see some men maybe approaching 60 or 70, I don't know how the NHS works, but it's a conundrum that almost uh, all my male friends in their 60s and 70s sometimes confront because of the uh, problems with uh, prostate cancer screening and understanding the meaning of it. Anyway, the cases of somebody, they don't say that they were screened, 
which, which I found really interesting. But the person was found to have a um, good prognosis prostate cancer. Those, something called, we use a Gleason scale for pathology of six, something that was uh, uh, not detectable by rectal exam. Um, usually uh, core biopsies are done under ultrasounds. Now they're up to 24, they used to be 12 are done. One of those little sectors shows a little bit of this cancer with funny looking cells in it. And the, doc, and the experts weighed in, and the surgeon said surgery, and the radiation oncologist said radiate, <laughs> you know, and the general internist uh, said, um, well, nobody says do nothing anymore. It's called either watchful waiting or active surveillance, and that's the point I want to get to. There is no surveillance <coughs> when it comes to risk. Anyway, that's another aspect of what I'm talking about. Um, and then people weighed in with their reasons around it. So I want to show you some of this data. So these are people arguing for surgery. And I don't, uh, I, I, for my own records, I, they sometimes they identify themselves as who they, which part, of, which part of the world they were and what they were, but I, I just have their little um, codes on for my own data. I haven't published this yet. Um, anyway, one person says, no point in waiting. It will progress. Do the definitive surgery now when chance of cure is high and when in good health. Mind you, nobody's citing randomized control trials. The data is not written in actual <laughs> data. I'm talking about the data later. Um, the best place for prostate cancer is in the, into a bottle in the pathology department. Um, another person said, I was diagnosed very similarly at, at age 51 and had a radical prostatectomy with nerve spirit 14 months ago. My PSA, that's the blood test used for screening, which is now, off, now used for surveillance in the post-therapy mode, um, is non-traceable. It's like, you know, they can't find it. I have no issues at all with incontinence. It's very rare, probably untrue. I have ED, that's erectile dysfunction, impotence. But I'm going through therapy <laughs> to hopefully correct it soon. Hope springs a turn. I can't believe I made it to realize it. I feel that this is a good trade-off to get <coughs> cancer-free. I do not recommend any other therapy. Get the cancer out of there before it kills. Wait too long and you'll lose the nerves. Wait longer and you won't be able to contain it. Dead is dead, people. Quit messing around with inadequate treatments. I'm trying to give you some level of the emotional um, uh, valence here. Now, when I talk about the work of of being in a state of risk. If you decide to do nothing, active surveillance, watchful waiting, whatever you want to call it, um, you are not, you're, you're not just simply in a state of limbo. I mean, you can be if you're resistant to medical intervention and you never show up at the urologist, but if you do show up, uh, it's not unusual to have a scene like this. And this is a doctor talking about why it's okay to have, he's actually arguing for non-surgery, non-radiation, because he can do all these things. So to track progression, PSA should be measured every three months. Transrectal ultrasound performed every six to 12 months, and repeat prostate needle biopsy at 12 to 24 month intervals. Progression defined as PSA velocity greater than 0.75 nanograms per milliliter a year, a rise in Gleason score, greater than 50% increase in lesion size on trust. So he has these highly quantitative, totally unproven thresholds with which he can use to then jump in uh, <coughs> for active treatment. He goes on to describe other tests, the gene tests being done, uh, new types of uh, MRIs that are, that are done through the rectal exam. Um, and he's confident that he can handle this in some way. Now, and I, I want, from the flip side of the patient, it's very similar to that woman I showed you with the HPV test. This, is, this produces every, anybody who's been through the, you know, the fear of anticipating the, these interventions. I have a friend who refused to uh, have her biopsy done at Mass General Hospital. Um, uh, and uh, the doctor looked at him and said, um, it's, well, it's up to you whether you want to go my way or, 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 or go for palliation, uh, was what, how they classified opting out of this uh, procedure. Okay, so th and this is sort of the punchline I want to get at. For those people, there are many of pe docs, mostly docs, who wrote back why they actually choose surgery and radiation up front. And the, the reason they said they choose surgery and radiation up front was not that it cures cancer or anything, but that, like that HPV example, it, it'll avoid that risk, that unbearable risk experience, which most people can't tolerate, so might as well get it over with. So one person said, it's rare indeed, it's a rare patient indeed, who's willing to follow another one of these euphemisms for that state of doing nothing is expected management. Uh, it's a rare patient indeed who's willing to follow expected management after being told they have prostate cancer. Another one wrote, a validated diagnosis of prostate cancer, from a psychological point of view, needs a treatment. And I could give a whole lecture on that sentence, you know, of the social, where this whole 
work is in some sense part of an interest I have in the social eff efficacy of risk prevention. Once the biopsy report is discussed with the patient, it will go through a period of heightened stress with its attendant complications. Radical prostatectomy with removal of malignant tissue from the body will improve the quality of life. Okay, and we're all interested in improving the quality of life as, as an endpoint of going on. So surgery will improve the quality of life because you will need that risk experience with all those tests and you will need So So um, I want to conclude. How much time do I have? Okay, okay. With a couple of, well, and I, I hope we do have some discussion about this. I know I've raised a lot of, sort of stirred the pot more than cooked a baked a bread or whatever. Uh, uh, is that I think this, this insight about how historically we have moved from those early women, you know, um, who were sort of the ground zero, who demanded surveillance because they had, they had belief now in medical therapy, the effectiveness of medical therapy, and they understood something about the natural history of disease and the hidden nature of processes happening. How we went from that to disease getting into everyone's body through public health and screening campaigns and the perception of efficacy that screening created as well as was the answer for fear. Fear of being both created, both it's was self-perpetuating, autocatalytic, like I said before, to the creation of a lot of risk states, which are sometimes diagnosed, like HPV uh, and the cancer, sometimes uh, a name has not yet been put to it, uh, frankly, which themselves become the objects of so many of our interventions. And the efficacy of so many interventions is to prevent those things from happening. It's certainly widespread in cancer, but I see it, like I said, in fetal ultrasound and screening and a lot of other things today. So let me give you some places where this, let me start with another example. I don't know if the Angela Jolie prophylactic mastectomy was big news in Britain, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, it was very big news uh, in the US, not, not really news actually, I mean, news that Angela Jolie did. Um, uh, this is not, she had, um, she had been tested positive for one of the mutations for the BRCA genes. Um, the, the data I want to show you here is a different situation. It probably accounts for more prophylactic mastectomies than women um, who have genetic or just uh, believe they have their increased risk for their fit based on familial or other psychological considerations. The common situation for prophylactic mastectomy is women who have cancer in one breast who then opt to have the other breast taken out. It's called contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. And the rates um, it doesn't look that impressive here, but over the course of 1998, over five years, are doubling, and sometimes, well, 1.8, 2.1, uh, you know, increases, you know, great increases in magnitude, especially if you, I, I don't know, the, this is from SEER data, some of the, the they were still going up the last time somebody looked at them um, in 2008. Um, uh, and the thing I want to call your attention to is the fact that although women at, these are stages of cancer, stage one, stage two, stage three. Although the absolute rates of prophylact contralateral prophylactic mastectomy are indeed higher with women who have higher stage disease, the, the rate of increase is the same. Okay? And from a simple, like almost Thomas McCunian perspective at some level, what's, ex what's behind um, you know, something that's happening across many different levels of objective risk? That's explaining. I think you know you, there's multiple levels of explanation that you need to to get at to understand this phenomenon. And the rising tide here that's raising these three stages of cancer ships, at some level, I would argue, is increased fear of disease. That's in fact, like I said, in many ways, part of the, the calculus of that is some of the historical process that I've described until now. Um, When women are asked, kind of like that prostate cancer example I gave you, why they opt for this, this is from a New York Times article, somebody said, uh, but women who have opted for the procedure say it's not about the statistics, this is a doctor talking. Once they receive a breast cancer diagnosis, they never again want to experience the stress of a mammogram or a biopsy. To have breast, to be a woman is to be at risk for breast cancer. To have had breast cancer is to, post after your initial treatment, is to live in a state of perpetual risk, potentially of getting breast cancer again. Um, and we can talk about some of those things. Oh, let me go back to this. Um, uh, some colleagues in the US did a study of uh, attitudes toward cancer screening tests. And it was a simple kind of Likert scale kind of survey um, uh, of 500 US adults. And generally speaking, there are really high, 
highly positive um, uh, um, values attached to cancer screening. They were interested in how, in the general population of people screened, compared to people who had experienced a false positive, what was the, and a false positive, in, they, had, they had some uh, qualitative data along with the survey. People described it sometimes as the worst time of their life until they were told that they didn't have cancer. They lived, and they often lived for weeks. You know, and this was different types of cancers, colon cancer, uh, prostate cancer, cervical cancer. And it turns out that unlike the 85% that's like check the Likert 5 or something about supporting screening tests, the, the group that had experiences false positive had the hot, had 98% rated general positive feelings for cancer screening. Now, to a Martian, you know, coming into this place, it's a, I, I would at least, my kind of Martian, it might be a little hard to explain why somebody who was, I, I could be conceptualized as iatrogenically harmed, has actually the highest positive attitudes for cancer screening. And I think you need to be an anthropologist to some extent to understand the ritualistic aspects and performative aspects of something like this, that you've, you've dodged, and people, you know, I've experienced this clinically in talking to people, people feel like they dodged a bullet. They had a kind of life-enhancing experience, near-death thing that they, they came out surviving them. And it has a lot of the kind of autocatalytic qualities that I try to describe on a temperature level, at an individual level, uh, in this thing. It's a scientifically induced implicit miracle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in, in, in some ways. Um, and I, I, actually, I'm not sure this. I'll just tell you what it was. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, this is, this is my thing for the, for, the, for the Brits here. When he was um, um, a presidential candidate, he was going around, he had prostate cancer diagnosis. And he was going around the country basically saying if he was in Britain, he'd be dead. <laughs> and, uh, and he was comparing the uh, survival rates in Britain to, you know, with, with, with socialized medicine like Cuba, he says. Uh, to, uh, unlike the NHS system, you weren't on Because of less screening, the apparent survival of, of, of people from cancer, from prostate cancer, is, is less in the UK. Uh, for all the reasons I discussed in the beginning, it had nothing to do with the actual efficacy of treatment. Anyway, I'll stop here. Thank you.